Yep, I'm going to start the webinar then. Yep. Hello again, everyone, and um, my apologies. We had a technical difficulty, so we appreciate everyone's patience as we sorted through that, and thank you for rejoining. We're just waiting for um, our chair, Rishi, um, to rejoin. So she should be on shortly. So please just give us a moment to get everything settled again. And thank you again for your patience. Um, and Valerie, um, I think I'm still in the main room. Okay, I could just- Language channel. Okay, I'll try to fix that then. Thank you, Lulu. Thanks. Okay, I think it should be all set now. Hello, everyone. Um, Val, thank you for handling that so well. And and Caroline Higley, I know, was also part of making that work. I don't know if Caroline is attending today, but thank you for doing that. Um, Kalila, um, you were in the middle of, of a point. So I don't know if you remember what it was, but if so, <laughs> you were commenting on how December 6th um, seemed a bit soon, but you thought that um, it was necessary given the time of our next meeting and you were about to say something else, I think. Yeah, I think, um, oh yeah, I think what I was saying was that, um, could we use part of the meeting on the 13th to also hear, from the public, um, their comments, um, because I know that there are a number of different listening sessions um, that are being held, but we won't have that, those will not be finished um, by the time of the meeting, nor will we have kind of information about what people are saying. So it does feel to me like before our comments get finalized, we should have an opportunity have some mechanism to hear from people. And then the other point um, that maybe is in relationship to something that Peter and others were saying about, um, you know, kind of getting input from departments and, and et cetera, is just, um, there are a number of comments, public comments from conversations that happened in the spring of last year that I assume um, were a part of the creation of this draft EJ strategy. Um, so there's a huge array of comments, but I don't actually have a sense from looking through them of to what extent those were incorporated in the draft strategies. Um, so it would be good to hear what happened with those comments and to what extent they were included or not. So that's a great question, Kalila, and thank you for bringing it up. Those comments um, that of that document that I sent in the email are available on the environmental justice page for EEA under the public participation link. And what those are is um, it's 20 pages of public comments that came in through listening sessions that EEA's EJ office held in the spring of 2021. And the way that those uh, listening sessions were planned were by subject matter. Um, they were six sessions um, over the course of, I believe, eight weeks, where we had folks come in and speak to us about um, whether they had concerns around energy, environment, climate change. And we had state EJ task force members listen in on those sessions and attend the ones that pertain to the topic that was being addressed. 
the task force members then took what they heard and incorporated it into their discussions within their agencies in making the strategy, developing the strategy for their agency. So that was sort of the launching point at which, um, from which the strategies came to be written, Kalila, in answer to your question. So um, there was, it, it, the sessions allowed folks, the staff at the agencies to become aware of what some of the um, most pressing concerns were from the public. And then they incorporated them into discussions and what they felt that they could put into their strategies, they did. So um, when we made the document that you read on the website, we tried to um, uh, put them under specific headings and categorize them so that at any time our staff could go in and consult with that document and we in, intend to hold those types of listening sessions periodically so that the content is updated. So that's why I had in the email I sent to you all directed your attention to that as um, a way to um, assess what's going on, you know, in discussions out amongst EJ neighborhoods and, and areas of concern. Um, in, with regard to your first question, which was that, could we have some mechanism with the EJ Council to hear about concerns beforehand? I'm, I, I want to put that back out to the group. It feels to me that with this nine-week comment period that we're giving um, on this strategy, I'm not. I would love to hear more from the public, and I can understand why you could help the EJ Council in its deliberations. Um, my question is, is there will be a lot of comments on this strategy and that's the purpose. I mean, that's why we're having a long comment period and we would definitely like to hear from the public. For the office at EEA, I don't, you know, we will have the benefit of the public viewpoint directly from those comments. And so one thing to think about is, does the EJ Council need those two in, in its deliberations? Can it gain the content of those comments from some of those listening sessions last spring? I'm conscious about the time and how we might go forward. So um, I guess the question here is, is do we want to allot some time on December 13th? to do that, to just hold, say, 45 minutes or even an hour of hearing from the public? Um, that's one question. Um, so I could put that out to the council now to see what you all think of that. This is Marcos. Um... I just to clarify uh, my understanding of the process we have so far, the idea is that we would send our individual comments to you, Rishi, um, if by the sixth, so that you could then synthesize those for the meeting on the thirteenth, and then conceivably, if that if we stuck with that first part, then I could imagine that we could leave open time during that 13th meeting on the 13th to have allow for public comment during that time period as we review the synthesis of those comments. And then that way we could possibly incorporate or revise as we hear from public commenters on our comment essentially. So we could amplify those, those concerns from the public. I wonder if that's... I, I think that's what we're considering now. Kalila, does that capture your comment in yes yeah i i yes so if we have i mean the one way that this could happen is we could have a 2 hour meeting perhaps um perhaps the 1 hour 1 hour is given over to listening to comments from the public the second hour could be about synthesizing um incorporating those comments into 
um, into the document that we would have in draft, like our EJC comments. We could leave that for the second half. You know, we could take in what some of the comments are from the public and include that in our deliberations. Does that capture it, Marcos? Or are you Yeah, I'm just trying to think through, you know, so we kind of did that before, I think, where people were commenting. So we'd have to have time to allow people to put co post comments or speak and then time to incorporate them, play it, do some wordsmithing, and then have something we could vote on, I guess, at the end of that meeting, or do we want to put it together and then delay a vote till the next meeting after that? This is Kalila. I thought, yeah, I thought the schedule did allow for some conversations in January as well, but maybe I'm. No, that's what I was contemplating that we could. I, I think we would want to think about things a little more like, you know, do a, a, a lot of listening and talking during the December 13th meeting and then uh, give us some time to um, incorporate it into a second document, which I would again take in comments, synthesize them, and then have something to share at the January 26th meeting, and then see if we couldn't reach consensus on um, a, a document then to submit then. So we would have another go at it. We would have another bite at the apple, Marcos, after the December 13th meeting. That makes more sense to me. Rishi, would that second document of oh, this is this is Caroline Hahn, would that second document include give other listening the synthesis of other listening sessions to date as well? Because I you know there are there are multiples within that time frame. So not just the one where where we are meeting on, on the December 13th, but then the others following as well. Well, I think it would only we we only have a December thirteenth meeting, and then the next one because of the holidays is not until that January twenty sixth. So I don't know. Oh, I see. Are you saying for the 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 January twenty tenth listening session? I don't think so because I I'm contemplating that those listening sessions are comments coming in directly to, to EEA from the public. Now, if they, if you happen to hear them or, you know, attend them and that affects your thought process around it and you share that in an EJC meeting, you know, we, we could incorporate that into our comments, but I don't anticipate um, that Car Carlene, Valerie, and I would be going through and synthesizing those dots because we wouldn't have them all yet. And we would be doing that after the comment period closes. Thank you. If there's no more comments, I just want to take a quick straw poll and see if folks think this isn't a good idea, what, we, what we've laid out so far. So um, what we've laid out. This is Kalila. Can I just ask one more question? What is, um, what's the date or the time frame by which the strategy is supposed to be finalized? We, uh, we would be operating under a new administration, Kalila. But right now, mid-March is, is when we're anticipating it. So mid to late March. So what we would do is take in the comments that come in by January 27th when the per comment period closes and EEA's EJ office would then be putting together um, an edited, amended copy of the um, strategy. We would be working with each of the agencies to see what of the public comments they could um, take in and amend their own strategies with. And then we would be also putting out a response to comments document where we would be um, making public all of the comments that have come in with our responses to them. We would probably be consolidating similar comments so that what would be issued in late March would be uh, the, final EJ strategy and a response to the comments that we received and having that be public avail publicly available. Thank you. 
Any other questions? So if not, I just want to take a, a quick straw poll on whether folks like this idea that um, on December 6th that you all would have reviewed and sent to me any um, input that you had, comments and edits from your areas of expertise on the um, strategy. I would consolidate those comments and put out a synthesized document, you know, a first draft of the EJC comments for discussion on December 13th. At the December 13th meeting, we would hold 45 minutes to an hour of public comment um, to hear from the public as to um, proposed comments, edits, amendments to the EJ strategy. And then we would deliberate the last half of that meeting, um, taking in those comments. And that after that, before the January 26th meeting, we would have another synthesized set of EJC comments to deliberate on um, and have a final vote on if we can reach consensus on January 26th. And then we would submit that in time for the public comment period closes the next day. So I'll just take a quick um, straw poll whether folks like that. Alila. Yes. Okay. okay, thanks. Melissa. Yes, uh, that is good. I think it's a little tight for me for time, but I will do my absolute best to get it done. Thank you. Thanks so much, Melissa. And, and again, you know, we have a we have we do have several weeks, so you know, we can all do the best we can and that, you know, we'll have several bites at the apple here. Um, Caroline, I think you said you liked that. Yes. I think, okay. Um, Lydia? Yes. Okay, great. Marcos? Yes. Okay, Peter? Yes. And Ari, okay, that's great. Ari, did, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, wonderful. Okay, so we will, we'll go forward on that schedule. I feel really good about that. I feel like We'll have we'll have some chances to talk about these issues with with some substance. So, um, where are we, Val, in our slides? <laughs> <laughs> Give me one second. Okay, and I need just a moment here. Um, So sorry, this is really. So we were going to um, talk now about um, the current EJ population definition, turn back to that discussion. And um, just a second. So um, Val, could you move on to the next slide, please? So here, as a reminder, we have what the EJ uh, population definition is currently. And I'm so sorry, I'm having trouble with my Um, so just by way of review, um, the, a neighborhood is a census block group on, in the act as defined by the United States Census Bureau and an environmental justice population um, is one 
a neighborhood that meets one or more of the following criteria. The annual median household income is not more than 65% of the statewide annual median household income, or racial minorities comprise 40% or more of the population, or 25% or more of households in the neighborhood lack English language proficiency, or the last one, which is that racial minorities comprise 25% or more of the population and the annual median household income of the town in which the neighborhood is located does not exceed 150% of the statewide median household income. So we are in the midst of discussing this question of who is missed by the current EJ population definition. So we've had some good discussions in the last two meetings about this. And the next two slides show a summary of those discussions based on income criteria and the race criteria. So please let me know if I've missed anything here. Um, next slide, please, Val. So I just wanna, I, I, my attempt here was to capture what our last discussions have been around these issues. So the first um, item here around income criteria considerations were, does the income criteria include the homeless population and where in Massachusetts geographically would this make a difference? Um, the second issue, does the income criteria adequately include white populations in rural areas. The third item, does the income criteria accurately capture the realities in a block group where a few large homes are placed adjacent to low income homes? This is also a gentrification issue, but the, it has a particular flavor in places like Plymouth, Cape Cod, and the Berkshires amongst a few other spots. Lastly, does the income criteria include cost of living considerations? Um, and then next slide, please, Val. Um, these were the racial minority criteria considerations. Um, how are indigenous individuals, federally recognized tribes, and non-federally recognized tribes included in the minority criteria? Second, can we craft a definition that explicitly includes tribes' traditional practices on off-tribal lands and on on-tribal lands, such as hunting, fishing, and other activities? Third item, regarding distributed populations, such as indigenous peoples, should we abandon block groups as an anchor for the criteria? And to these two, I would like to add a couple of more, which I think are, are more articulately stated. Um, so another item would be, because indigenous tribes in Massachusetts are sovereign nations, can there be a way to identify them as EJ populations other than by being defined as a racial minority as they are in EEA's EJ policy, the current policy? And then lastly, are indigenous communities that are not federally recognized tribes included in the de definition? How about the geographic area of where they live and what about their access to land? So in these two criteria for income and minority, I just wanna ask the council members, they feel that we have missed anything in the way these two slides, you know, with my two additions. Um, to this particular slide. I'd like to open it up, see if I've missed anything. And, and if so, um, happy to add that for next time, but just want to make sure of that. If anyone has anything to add? Lydia? Yeah, I that was amazing uh, summary. I think that there's just as you actually, as you said, in the income criteria, there's another, you know, in number three, it speaks to um, rural areas, but it's also urban areas. Um, okay, thank you, Lydia. 
I, I income, think as I was reading it, I realized I didn't put in the urban. Yeah, income sure. within a small scale, low income neighborhood that's experiencing gentrification. Okay. Um, and then I think in the minority criteria, I think a possibility is not just abandoning census block groups as an anchor for the EJ population definition, but um, maybe having census block groups as an anchor, but also um, a special or separate consideration of indigenous peoples. Okay, thank you. So you're sort of saying it's um, the census block group and an, an additional. Right, seems like another option. Thank you, okay. Any other thoughts? This is Marcos. Um, so I, this is a little sort of at an angle to what you're asking. Um, so I know we're uh, capturing the thoughts and the questions of the council so far. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have an opportunity to, to talk about the questions themselves. At, in their discussion too, because I think some of these are technical questions that could be answered directly, and some of them are deeper questions about context and purpose of the policy overall. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Yeah, thank you, Marcos. Um, I, I, I feel like it would be a good exercise for us to collect some of these questions first, and then, you know, this is related to the process of how we're going to be um, answering and conducting the analysis. Um, so I, I, if folks agree with this, I would like to, as you say, keep a mixture of some questions that can be answered just technically and others that need more analysis and partition those out uh, later, you know, when we've collected a good um, number of these considerations. These, Any other? This, this is Kalila. This seems like a good summary of the questions that were raised at the last meeting. Okay. If that's the case, if, if folks don't have any other comments on this, um, I'd like to, Val, could we have the next slide? I'd like to open it up for consideration of the third criteria of limited, limited English proficiency considerations. Um, and the question is the same, who is missed by the current um, EJ population definition? I'm just, I know we've lost a bit of precious time there with um, our technical glitch, but perhaps we could consider this for about 10 minutes and then leave about 10 minutes for um, questions and comments from the public. So if we could spend 10 minutes just initially addressing this question, um, this is not by means the last chance we'll have to, to talk about the limited English proficiency criteria, but let's at least begin and then and then um, move on over to public comment. So um, does anybody want to start off the discussion here on um, this particular criteria and who is missed? One question that we have that I just want to show um, that I just want to put out there is um, our information pertaining to language on the environmental justice maps is provided by language tract, which is larger than um, the block group uh, granularity, the, which is the neighborhood granularity. So we when we look at languages on the EJ maps, we're looking at that information through the larger tract. So we lose some of the specificity um, that we have when we're able to get that information at a block group level. 
Uh, Rishi, this is Marcos. So I, could, I, I want some clarification on that point, just because I work with the data myself. So as you know, um, I thought it was at the black group level, but I wasn't sure. It's not clear from the documentation how that is being reported. Um, my belief about this, and this may be a question, you know, that we should put down that could be answered through technical, you know, through, through experts is, although it appears on the maps at the tracked level, when you click on the map at a particular block group, what the pop-up screen tells you is the language information for the tract in which that block group is located. So the language is reported out at the tract level, but because we are trying in our Massachusetts maps to convey information at the block group level, it's reflecting what there is at a tract level. So I think that raises issues of dilution, you know, of, of the information, um, you know, where in a particular tract are, say, people who speak um, Criollo, you know, there may be a Cape Verdean population that is centered in one geographic area of the tract, but may not be in another geographic area of the tract. So there's there's um, a need to ground truth the information that we learn from the maps. So um, okay, well, I have a different I, I have a different understanding of how that works. The data is available at the block group level for the limited English speaking households, not the languages per se, but the so the the criterion in the EJ definition identifies census block groups. So these are a little larger than a urban block, several like a small neighborhood that have 25% or more of households where no adult speaks English very well. It doesn't tell you which language they don't speak. I mean, which is their native language, but it, so that is available at the block group level from the American Community Survey data, which I think should be in there. Um, so I just made make sure we're talking about the same thing. You're bringing up a really important distinction. So you're saying that an LEP population can be identified by block group, but not the language that they speak. Yeah, I have to double check on the language identification. That one's more generalized. The more detailed you go, the smaller the unit. Um, but the LEP, limited English proficiency criterion, is definitely available at the, at the block group level. Okay, so that's... That, that is something to um, to pursue for sure. The maps have always been designed to help identify the languages that um, you know any outreach materials would need to be translated into or interpreters provided. So I think um, I think that that is what is confusing and, and I believe provided at the tract level. Any other? Um, I would add, I would add that uh, regardless of the language, uh, using terminology in the literature that everyone can understand, imagining someone else outside of these groups reading this information so they can interpret it properly. Thank you, Arne. Yep. I just had a question for Marcos, I guess. Um, so for LEP population, that's based on not having an adult in a household, you said, that speaks English very well. So right. if there was a household where there was an LEP elder, but there was somebody else in the household who spoke English um, well enough, then, then that would not be captured. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And Marcos, that age 
in a prior version of the census, I think used to be over five years old. Isn't that right? And now it's currently over 14. Yeah, I'd have to check to double. I'd have to double check, but I'd, I'd say for the ACS, for the last few rounds, it's been 14, anyone under 14, anyone over 14, excuse me, who doesn't speak English very well in a household. Um, but yeah, I think maybe in the earlier decennial censuses, they might have been in a younger age. I I just want to come. I mean, we're we're really close to time to switch over to public comments, but I want to mark this the challenge here, which is that it's I have found it difficult to be able to set up a dialogue with limited English proficiency populations and get through the language barriers, and it seems to me that especially in this particular area, that in formulating what isn't working, that we as the EJ Council might want to dedicate a meeting where we are, where we've used all of our contacts from the EJ office to get out to certain groups to ask what the issues are. We, I just feel like, you know, as part of the English speaking population, it's very difficult for us to conceive of what the barriers are on the other side of the language issues. Um, and I, I think it would be really um, well worth the effort of this group and the pinnacle on which it sits to make that effort to reach out to those populations and sort of something like what Kalila was saying earlier for the EJ strategy, perhaps set up some type of, of meeting where we're really trying to pull people in as much as we can using our interpretations channels that we've set up to take in public comment on why people feel they can't participate or why they may not participate, um, how we're miscounting or not counting and ways in which we might capture um, more accurately who's living where. You know, and so I, I see Lydia's hand up, but. I think it's a good idea to have a special um, discussion of this, and maybe we might need a little bit more time if we actually want to seek that input directly from limited English speaking populations, because I think there are just so many levels of barrier beyond providing interpretation at a meeting. Um, it's just like, who even knows that this whole process is going on? Who knows how to access Zoom meetings? You know, who's getting emails? It's, I, I, you know, coming from a limited English speaking community, I just know how difficult it is for people to even participate in more localized um, activities and, you know, that are happening, public meetings that are happening that you know, that are about things that they may be more familiar with. But yeah, I just think that it goes way beyond the, the meetings. <laughs> Thank you, Lydia. This is Marcos. Um, just want to uh, say also, I'm very supportive of that idea too, to, to hear what folks have to say. And I, won't, I also want to point out, because I work with this data so often, and I'm not putting myself out as the expert on this, but I want to point out that the LEP criterion for the EJ definition as it's existed for some time now is um, one of the most predictive of where you find most environmental burdens in the state. Um, it's actually in talk climate change risk for uh, pollution, you name it. Um, that's one of the strongest predictors of that. So it's a very powerful criterion, but it's probably also one that we know the least about in terms of what needs to happen in those communities. So that would be a great conversation to have. And also to think about like Lydia's question, it doesn't, it counts households, it doesn't count individuals who are LEP or limited English proficient. Thank you, Marco. Any other comments on this? And as I said, this is just an initial opening up of this topic, which I think is, it presents a bunch of its own unique challenges.
Rishi, this is this is this is Caroline. I'm just I'm wondering, as as we're thinking about it, because I completely support diving in deeper here, um, especially given Marcus's comments and and give the backdrop under which Lydia's framed it as well. Is do we can we also just so that we have this in the back of our minds, have the definition or the current process by which um, populations can apply to be included for exceptions as well. So we can understand at least give, if, if you can't pick it all up through the statistics and the maps and the data, what is the current process for exception? And then maybe there's some work that we can do there to make sure that is also very accessible too. So that's a great question, Caroline. And I and um, I I um, I know other folks have brought that up previously about publicizing very well the way in which one can petition um, to be an EJ neighborhood. So um, I can what, for our next discussion, I will include that language more explicitly. And I also want to point out that we are um, at the at EEA, we're in the process of putting together language for um, a regulation that would sort of spell out the details on how a community could do that. So that's in the works. We haven't arrived at those regulations yet, um, but we're putting those together. So for our next meeting, I will definitely um, make that can be part of the conversation the next time we address the limited English proficiency issue. The way that I see this rolling out with the strategy, it seems to me that because of the time issues with the strategy, the next couple of meetings, we might need to focus on that um, and dedicate some time to that. So when we come back to the LEP issue, uh, it might be that January meeting, it might be the February, that first February meeting. So I don't see us talking about this in December, but when we come to back to it, I will make note of all of these and we can talk about it in this context. So um, if you don't mind, I'd like to, unless there were more comments on this, I wanna just turn it over for any sort of public questions and comments. Um, give folks a chance to do that even with five minutes we have left. Um, Val, I don't know if there are any comments that we've gotten in from the question and answer or the chat. Yeah. Yeah. There's one comment in the, in the chat and then we have um, someone's hand up. So I'll ask the question in the chat first and I'll just summarize it. Um, I think the essential question was, um, will there be time in future EJ council meetings to have, um, to allow public comments on, um, environmental justice concerns, so a less constrained dialogue on environmental justice concerns. Is that something, um, that, is that something that could happen at one of the EJ council meetings or meetings moving forward? Um, I'm taking that to mean a, a greater amount of time than at the end of each of these meetings. Yeah, and I think um, to ask more specific environmental justice questions about environmental justice concerns in um, their communities, I think is the idea of that question. So um, we will have a little more time to talk. We're what we're talking about in terms of the strategies, there will be some more relaxed time in the very next meeting. Um, but if, if um, you know, we will consider perhaps holding um, another hour or another set of, of uh, EJ council meetings to do that. Um, and we'll take note of that, the request to do that. I think that would be a very productive and enlightening meeting. And then um, we have a question from Sarah Freeman. So I'm gonna give Sarah the ability to ask the question. Hi okay. everyone. Um, I really appreciate the work you're doing and I understand that you're early in the game in terms of still defining the populations. And my question is more to do with projects under review now and i'm concerned because in the waning days of this administration the, i'm aware of at least one project that has been dysfunctional to say the least in terms of the treatment of its ej neighbors and 
so it, it's an awkward question, but wonder if there's a way, like my understanding is there's already a um, an expectation that all projects are looked at through an EJ lens. I don't believe that's been the case and would welcome any advice about how one might flag something like this before um, it's fast tracked in a, in a harmful direction. Um, thank you for that um, question, Ms. Freeman. There is on our EJ Council uh, website, there is a, a, a link where you could submit more specific questions, say about a project that's going on in your neighborhood. And we will pick that up. And if you would like to um, uh, have a meeting about that to talk with um, uh, Carlene Lemoyne, who is our environmental um, justice external stakeholder coordinator, we will certainly set that up. You could also email her directly. Her uh, link is also available on our EJ website and we could talk about the specifics um, in your neighborhood that you're especially concerned about uh, and, and the analysis through an EJ lens. Thank you. And there's another question here. Um, and I think this might be the only one we have time for, but regarding community grants slash funds, will there be more programs and regulations developed to help prevent activities and businesses that damage communities from being able to operate rather than placing the burden of remediation after the damage has been done on the communities? Um, it, in terms of a general, in terms of a general approach, so there's so many um, agencies that are involved in that type of work. I would um, invite that commenter to uh, please check out the EJ strategy and see if there may be a way that the strat that the agencies have articulated how they will um, address that sort of work in the future. Um, it's a general question, I think, and it's about a general approach. So I would, I would visit the strategies and see how the agencies might be able to look at that in the future in, in their own workings. I don't know if that answers the question, but it is a certain place I think to lodge that concern. Um, we are very near time. Um, I'd like to go back to the slides, Val, if you can put up the slide. Yeah, and we have a few council members who have to drop off, so yeah. we should end shortly. So I would like to take a motion to um, um, adjourn, please. Um, do I have somebody who will move for that? I'll move. So I'll move Melissa Ferretti or second. I'll second. How's that? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Marcos and Melissa. I think that's who it's two words. So um, I will just run down. Um, Kalila, uh, move to adjourn. Yes. Thank you, Caroline Hahn. Did she already have to drop off? Okay. Um, Lydia Lowe, please. Yes. Okay. Peter Mathe. He may have had to have gone to. All right. And uh, Ari Zor. Okay, well, I will call us adjourned. <laughs> With that, thank you all. And um, I will uh, see you all at the December 13th meeting and I'll send some materials for that as well. Thank you for this meeting today and for dealing with all of the little glitches along the way. Have a good week, everyone, and some time off. Right. Thank Take care. You. Have a good holiday. Thank you to the interpreters and the recorders as well. Bye-bye.